I love you. <laughs> Woo! You could be seated. Oh my goodness, I'm ready for you. I'm ready to love you. Oh my gosh, I just want to clear something up. Um, I know all Asians look alike. Francis and I are not uh, related. And uh, Francis is Chinese and I'm Japanese American. And uh, that, those are two different, totally different countries. Um, but I can understand you say all Asians look alike because for 15 years, my husband and I, a white boy, we, we <laughs> been living in Asia. And one day I came back, one year I came back and I said, babe, and I was dead serious. I said, oh, white people are starting to look alike to me. <laughs> So I think it's who you're around. <laughs> you get used to it. You should see some of your eyes are this big. <laughs> you're, you're, you're very cute white people. You're very cute. <laughs> Listen, I'm third generation Japanese American and my ethnic people group brought to you sushi. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Hey, you're welcome. We brought you ninjas. Not Ninja Turtles. Again, that was, I think that white people did Ninja Turtles, but we brought you ninjas. We brought you samurai warriors. We brought you sumo wrestling. Okay, we're not super excited about sumo wrestling. Uh, they're, they're super rock stars in Japan, but in Japanese Americans, you know, mm, I don't know about those sumo wrestlers. And oh my gosh, we brought you World War II. Listen, I'm so, so sorry. But <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. But that's a whole nother subject, a whole nother thing that we could talk about another time. But today in Japan, there are less than 1% Christian in Japan, and it's a nation full of hurting people. If you're called, please go. Can you imagine there's still a nation on earth where there are less than 1% Christian? Mike and I were headed to Japan, but God diverted us to another place in Asia where there are less than 1% Christian. We were so relieved that we can be a part of the last Day's harvest and be where the harvest is great and the laborers are few. Listen, we've been telling your leaders this. We've told your staff this. Um, there's, you are Antioch. The Antioch movement is what we call heavenly, a heavenly hotspot. A heavenly hotspot. It's a place where you could just sense this is where heaven's operating. This is where God's dreams and his visions are are happening, are being carried out. Antioch, the first 24 hours I was with you, I, I'm a, I was a better Christian. <laughs> and the second day I go, how many days have we been here? I felt like I had been through like a full on, you know, restoration seminar, got all my alignment back. I'm amazing. This is an amazing place. I, I told uh, your leaders, I said, I, you know, when I'm in the throne room, I can smell heaven here. I can smell the throne room. I can, it feels like the throne room. You're so, you can be here. I can't even believe it. <laughs> this is your home. Oh, Wow, 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 wow. I'm tempted like this much to quit what I'm doing to be here and to help you like this, just this, this much, this much, Father, that's all, just for a second. So here's our background. Here's our background. We were business owners, Michael and I, in the motion picture industry. And uh, listen, if we weren't called to ministry, we would be making as much money as possible to fund the gospel. For sure, when we are in business, God blessed, hey, the same principles that we use in ministry, the same heart that we use in ministry is what you do in business. He's in charge, he's the boss. And so the IRS audited, audited us twice saying there's no way you made that much money and you gave that much money, but we are able to be an amazing testimony to our IRS agent. <laughs> yes, we did. Oh my gosh, I, we love making money. That's super easy compared to, you know, missions work. Where you don't have a congregation. You don't have anything. You have to totally trust heaven. So it's like you get the manna from heaven. You get to walk through the Red Sea. It's totally, I, I wouldn't change it for nothing. 
I wouldn't change it for nothing. So we've been missionaries in Thailand for 15 years. We started Zoe International 17 years ago, and now our ministry is in five different countries. There are two mandates and always have been. Listen, if God changes it, no problem, but they, they've always been this. He assigned us to preach the gospel in particular to those that have never heard, uh, and then also to help end the human trafficking of children globally, as well as care for orphans who are in danger. Now, how did that happen? 17 and a half years ago, we were in church, minding our own business, and fully involved in the gospel and kingdom work. And uh, a little missionary got up, and she started talking about human slaves, and she started talking. You could get a little boy and a little girl menu on the corner, and you could pick what child you want for the night to do whatever you want with that child. And we said, what? What? No, 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 wait, ha, wait, ha, wait a minute, not why we're alive. And so we got on our knees, we wept, we said, Father, why are we here in America? Why are we still here, Father? That's our heart. Father, we know you're a good God and you're doing something about it. And so we crawled into, into God's heart in prayer. And, you know, we're, we, we had no debt. We're sitting in a custom, beautiful custom home, luxury cars. I had a six-carat uh, diamond wedding ring that was uh, obnoxious, humongous, beautiful, gorgeous. I loved it. And... <laughs> We said, listen, whatever you, we have, all of our stuff is your stuff. Just say the word. L look me in the eye. I said, say the word. Michael said, say the word. What do you want? You, you, wh how can we help you? You see all this stuff? The stuff, listen, there's nothing wrong with having a bunch of stuff. Just don't let it have you. So the minute God says, hey, I need to borrow something of yours, you got to be ready to just let it go. And it shouldn't be painful because the same way you got it was from heaven anyways. Blessings and direction from heaven anyways. So, so we prayed. So we're in God's heart, you know, and it took five days. You know, God won't speak to you if you're not ready to hear him. He's, he doesn't play that way. He's not like a little puppy, right? He's not a child. He's all mighty God. And after the fifth day, we must have been ready to hear because this is what we heard him say. I hear their cries and I need your life. And the only thing that we were wondering was, how do you get the money? And he said, don't worry about the money. I'll bring people that have my heart to help you. And uh, that was the only question we had. But we never said but to him again. Because we, in all the years, I'm 58 years old. I've been a Christian I, back then. Well, now I've been a Christian for over 50 years. You know, and I've never heard the broken heart of God. I never experienced that, you know, in, in prayer or at all, except for this one moment. And he said, I hear their cries and I need your life. And with that, we never asked another question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No problem. No problem. Um, now, here's the problem with, the, here's the things in the natural that was a problem. We weren't qualified. It, it, we didn't think we were qualified to do what he was asking us to do. Listen, our history and our background had nothing to do with what we're doing today. Seemingly. Seemingly. We didn't have things sorted out. We weren't trained for such a, such a time as this. All the things that we knew and we experienced, it, it helps you on the mission field, but it, we weren't trained. We were unqualified and still are. But the most important bits of the journey that we've had was what we were training for all our life when we made Jesus the master and the Lord of our life. Where do I go, to the left or the right? What do I say? What's your strategy? So this morning, I want to talk to you about working with heaven. Yeah. And I want to talk to you uh, that we were created to work for heaven. We were shaped, molded, thought up in God's mind to work with heaven and for God. Reminds me of an eight-year-old little girl who we rescued. She was uh, rescued in a, 
uh, sweet. We swept a bunch of kids that were being uh, trafficked as, as beggar slaves. But she was swept in this whole group. And uh, her family was illegal in the country, and they were begging as a family, but she was not trafficked. But it took us three months to figure out who she was. Well, immigration had already returned her to her, their, the family to their country of origin, but we still had this little girl who came as a loyal Buddhist to our home, but before she left, she received Jesus as her Lord. And we never know how, how, what that is, right? What does that look like? How does that play out? It, was it real, you know? And so she went home, and her father called us a couple weeks later after she got home and said, you returned to me a very respectful little girl, but she refuses to bow to Buddha. We take her to the temple, and she refuses to bow to Buddha. And see, what you don't understand, she's eight years old, and she's a little chick. She's a little girl, and she uh, doesn't have a sibling, not a grandma or grandpa, auntie, uncle, parent who is a Christian. There's not a person at school her teachers, village leaders, neighbors, no one, not one person in the whole village is a Christian. And that little eight-year-old girl, listen, in Asia, you don't stand out. You don't wear this thing. You wear navy and black. You just blend. Okay? And she, she stood out. She stood up and just said, no, I cannot bow. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. I cannot bow. Eight years old. Now, a, few, a little bit while later, a couple months later, uh, the evangelist who worked that village, that area, said, for years I've, pre I've ministered in that village and nobody's come to Christ. But because the, the little girl's family watched her devotion and her love for God, and they all came to Jesus because of that little girl's love for Jesus. And the evangelist told us, I've never seen a greater evangelist in all my life than the, the little girl's mother. She was, she positioned herself right. She positioned herself properly to work for heaven. You think that little girl's perfect? No way. You think she's perfect? No. It's not about being perfect. She was in the right posture to work with heaven. She was in the right posture. In Mark 12, 29 uh, through 31, the Bible says, Jesus answered him. The most important of all the commandments is this. The Lord Yahweh, our God, is one. You are to love the Lord Yahweh, your God, with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, with every thought that is within you, and with all your strength. This is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is this. You must love your neighbor in the same way you love yourself. You will never find a greater commandment than these. Positioning ourselves to be used by Almighty God in heaven. Jesus is our supreme and highest example of how to work with heaven and how to love the Father back. Jesus was on his way to the cross. In Mark 14, 33 through 36, he said Jesus took Peter, Jacob, and John with him. An intense feeling of great horror plunged his soul into deep sorrow and agony. And he said to them, my heart is overwhelmed with anguish and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Stay here and keep watch with me. He walked a short distance away and, be, and being overcome with grief, he threw himself face down on the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, he would not have to experience this hour of suffering. He prayed, Abba, my father, all things are possible for you. Please don't allow me to drink this cup of suffering yet. What I want is not important, for I only desire to fulfill your plan for me. Jesus said, yet what I want is not important, for I only desire to fulfill your plan with me. I'm so glad that in the Bible we saw that Jesus had to make a hard decision. Even unto death, he just felt like he was dying in making that decision. Yet... Not my will, another translation says, but yours be done. And another one says, not what I want, but what you want, Father. It's the language of heaven. 
yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Do what you want, Father, not what I want. It's not about me. If we don't understand how to position ourselves working with heaven, that it's not about me. We'll never, we'll never be used by God in the ways that he dreamt for you and I to be used. You will never, young person, you will never tap your potential with just school. There is one designer who dreamt you up in his mind uniquely. He dreamt you up. He is the only one who holds the plans that he has for your life. The only one. And without him, without you serving him, without you laying your life at his feet, you will never know how high. You will never know your potential on this earth without him. You will tap out long before God ever intended you to. It's not just about w uh, uh, the, um, where you land or what you do. It's about positioning yourself to say, I won't bow to anything else or anyone else but you. It's staying in that posture our entire life. It's proper. It's right. It's natural. It's heaven's language, not my will. In everything we do, in the plans we make, Father, I want your desires. Father, I want your ambitions. Father, I want your motives. And let me tell you, if you spend any time discussing plans in the throne room, it will blow your mind. He thinks big. I've never gone in and gone out with something simple. Something simple like, I, I got that. Never. He doesn't even discuss the simple stuff because he knows we got it. But it's, he always factors in the God peace that we can never do what he's asked us to do without him. He will never factor himself out of life with you and I. Never. I remember this other young girl that was returned to her mother after she was rescued, 10 years old. And our team saw her on the street and the mother looked different. And straight from the mother's mouth, she said, when you return my daughter to me, she was Buddhist. And she came and she said, I'm a Christian, mom. I'm a Christian. And she said, I beat her. I beat her because of, out of fear of evil spirits. I beat her out of fear from the community. You say you're not a Christian. Say you're not a Christian. It, it, just fearful. She said, I beat her and beat her every day until her daughter looked her, at her and said, you could beat me till I die. I will never give up Jesus. <laughs> now listen to me. That's two kids' stories, two little girl stories. What makes us buckle? What makes us bow? Who's so big and monstrous and scary that when we're in front of them that we just buckle? We just bow. We bow to peer pressure. We bow to uh, our family expectations. Well, whatever it is, what is it? Who is it? Who is it? So I, I chose those examples because they're just little kids. Little kids that as, at that age are naturally obey their parents. They were God. It's God given for them to obey their parents. And yet, and yet, you could beat me till I die? I'm never giving up Jesus. That's the right posture, little girl. You don't have to be perfect. Don't you worry about being perfect. You just keep pursuing that relationship with Almighty God. Does this look perfect? <laughs> My gosh. Use me as an example. That if that Chucky little sumo, pre-sumo chick can serve the Lord. I don't feel bad about myself. Listen, I looked at Laura, Pastor Laura, I said, that's it. It's on. <laughs> the, it's on. I looked at her, I said, she is so adorable. I needed like a vision in front of me. <laughs> I think I need to take a picture of her. You better appreciate that, Pastor Jimmy. <laughs> You better appreciate it. My, my sweetheart, 
I love you, sweet. I thank you so much for staying married to me. <laughs> In Matthew 10, 35 through 37, it says, listen, if you don't know, if you've never seen Pastor Laura, she's the hottest 50-some-year-old lady I've ever seen. And she stayed hot all these years. I don't think you've ever had got fat. Have you ever got fat? <laughs> but here's the thing. Have you ever seen her eat? It's no mystery. <laughs> Lettuce without dressing. It, it, it's no mystery, you know, why. Okay, Matthew 10, 35 through 37 says, you better, you better bring it in, hone it in. See how fast I got back? Matthew 10, 35 through 37 says, for I've come to turn a, okay, I never could preach this message until later in life when I saw evidence of what it looked like. It, it, it's so disturbing, okay? It says, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's en enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. But in comparison to who God is, it makes total sense. Total sense. But it's intense. But I can't sugar down. This is from the father. This is right straight from the father. This is his expectation. This is his expectation. From, do you know that for, for many people around the world, when they accept Jesus, when they make a decision to accept Jesus, they're also simultaneously making a decision to say goodbye to their family because their family is going to disown them. Some things, you know, some things that happen, some things that people do, I think makes Jesus stand up from his throne. There's not a lot that might get him up from his throne, but there are some things that I've seen that will make God, I know he stands up from his throne. Hey, Stephen, that when he was getting stoned, the heavens opened and he saw Jesus standing. And they locked eyes. Oh! Some things that you will do in your lifetime might bring Jesus to his feet. Listen, we're not going to wait till he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear that now. <laughs> we're not waiting. Yeah. No, no. What? No, our relationship's supposed to be vibrant now. Now, our earth life. And earth life is very short. So at five years old, I got saved and made Jesus the Lord of my life. We did not go to a church like Antioch, so I didn't understand a thing that was ever taught to me. But I had parents that pursued God on their own, still didn't know enough what it meant to make Jesus the Lord and Master, not just Savior, Lord and Master of my life until Listen, when I was a teenager, I tried so hard to backslide. And my parents prayed and just ruined it for me. <laughs> There's four daughters in our family, three of them angels. Angels, halo, and they don't deny it. They're good girls. They're sweet, amazing. And I was like the devil to raise. <laughs> and um, I wanted the world so bad. I wanted the world, to, the devil's chanting my name, chanting my name. And I didn't know, I wasn't in love with Jesus. I didn't know him. I didn't know who he was. I had no idea. So people who say, oh, I tried Christianity. Oh no, you haven't tried Christianity. Because if you try, if you know him, you will never leave him. You will never leave him. <laughs> never, never, never. You will give your life to God. If you knew him, who he really is. So at 18, I said, that, I can't, I can't, I'm just struggling. I said, okay, God, here's the deal. Because my personality, I'm in or out, you know, white or black. You know, uh, my, my exercise regimen is I'm going to be a triathlete the first day or forget it. <laughs> Listen, in my dreams, I am a triathlete, so just... Yeah, I, when I go to bed, I'm like, wow, I wake up, woo, I'm exhausted. <laughs> so, 
I, anyways, I told God, I said, God, here's the deal. I, I can't do this. It's just not who I am. I can't serve you and pretend. I can't do it. I won't do it. Here's the thing. I won't do it. And he made us that way. To, to fake it? What? And so, so I said, I'm going to, my dad called me right before college and he said, hey, I, he's very gentle, you know. He says, hey, do you want to go to Bible school? I was praying and God uh, just wanted me to call you and invite you. I said, yes. I said, yes, because trying to backslide is miserable. <laughs> so here's the deal. Father, respectfully, sir, I'm going to give you one year and I'm going to read your Bible and I'm going to love you the way you want to be loved, not on my terms. You got to know that. He's not going to, no, you're not the boss. We're, we're little human beings amongst billions of people. We're just little human beings. No, no, we do it his way. Yeah. We're not, there's no, what, the, the, the vocabulary word entitled, I don't even think heaven knows what that word means. And so, so I said, Father, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to do everything it says to do for one year, and I mean it. I don't care who's on the right or left of me because this is very serious. And I knew, you know, does it mean hell? Does it mean what? You know, this is very serious. So I got, this is between me and you, God. Well, that was when I was 18. I'm 58 years old, so that was 40 years ago. I never looked back. I fell in love with Jesus. I fell in love with Jesus through his word and through doing his word. And I never looked back. So my quest, my life scripture went from he supplies all my needs to my life quest scripture, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, trust in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. So the word in the Bible became, that's awesome. Is that my countdown clock? I have like 32 minutes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This church is like heaven. It is. Yeah. Woo. Yeah, you think you've only sat there for a little while. No, heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to be able to finish everything I think that I planned. Okay, so the word of God, the Bible, scriptures became my training manual on how to work for heaven. It's our training manual. You know, if you were raised in the church, B-I-B-L-E, listen, basic instructions before leaving earth. What? Little Waco town in Texas? You didn't ever heard that as a kid? Yeah, it's awesome. Basic instructions before leaving earth. That's our training manual. Oh, it's training too. There's no question about it. So as I got into the word, I started to think differently. I began to experience heaven working in my ordinary everyday life. Not just when I became Ooh, a missionary, not just when I can. No, you start now. Yeah. It starts now. He's a now God. Yeah. And, and so when I was 21 years old, I was living in Hawaii, and I was working at Anna Miller's restaurant. Now, Anna Miller's is still there today. It's in Pearl Ridge. And so I was a cashier working at Anna Miller's, ordinary life, you know. It was the time when I was like, I don't know what you want from me. I don't know what you want me to do. Like, what am I called to? What's my calling? So while I was waiting, I got a job. Get a job. Yeah, yeah don't, don't, don't just sit around, right? You don't work, you don't eat. I mean, I, there's scriptures, right, that will train you, train you. So anyways, I got a job, and uh, there was a series of robberies. Now, what I'm about to tell you is documented in the Honolulu Police Department. This is totally the truth. So um, I was there in Hawaii. I'm like, Father, you know, what do you want me to do? I had a heart for the poor. I, I, there's, some old, there's some homeless people on the beach that I befriended. I said, if you ever want a meal, come to my restaurants. I'll feed you. And so um, 
it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. It's a 24-hour restaurant. And there was a guy who came came up to the pie counter where the cash register was and normally there's tons of people behind me getting pies and whatever but nobody was there and he was nervous he had his meal ticket he's nervous and he said put all your money in a bag this is a hold up so they get when you start as a cashier they give you a, a little sheet and it says a b c one two three what to do in a robbery so i'm gonna tell you what you do with that paper you'd wad it up and pitch it because this is what in reality happens. Whatever's in you comes out. So whatever you've put in your heart, you, you respond, you react, right? Often in life, that's why, that's why it's critical that you put the word in your heart because that's your knee-jerk reaction to life. So my re knee-jerk reaction was, it's not that I'm so holy, it's not that, but I, just heaven, the training it had me thinking differently. So he said, put all your money in a bag. This is a whole thing. And I looked at him and I said, oh, he needs Jesus. <laughs> One, two, I need Jesus here now, stat. And so I leaned over as close as I could get to him and I said, Jesus loves you so much. And I began to share the gospel. He goes, stop it, stop it. And he went, uh, uh. his feet were stuck to the ground. So he's trying to run, he's trying to run. And I, I, I saw that, but it, you know, when stuff like that happens, I'm telling you, there's a grace for you to just keep going. And so, um, uh, so he's trying to get away. And here's the thing, the police told us that there was, they never could catch him because they always had a getaway car around the corner. And if it looked like they weren't getting the money, they would take off and leave. So he's trying to run, but I knew, I knew that God is saving his life. And so he said, he said, put all your, and then some, somebody walked up. There was a couple that walked up to pay their bill. And here's Philippians 2, 9. God has uh, given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And so I, you know, the devil has to, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He's given us all the tools that we need to destroy the works of the enemy, to, make, to do what he wants us to do. And so anyways, this couple came in and I looked at him and I went, shh, shh. And he stayed there silently. How was your meal? And I opened the cash register. And I, I, and I inside I'm talking to God like, and God's saying, pull the last $10 bill, which is the silent alarm. And I said, please, I just got to take him to church, Father. I just got, I was 21, not super duper mature, you know, just big heart, big heart. And I, God, please, I, I don't want to pull the silent alarm. I just have to get him to church. No, no, you need to pull the silent alarm. We need to save his life. And so um, I did, and I closed the drawer. He, st he sat there obedient, you know, and then <laughs> he said, put, put your money in the bag. I have a gun. So instantly the scripture, I didn't know a ton of scripture now. I didn't pay super good attention in Bible school. And, um, but I, what I did know helped me. And I knew in Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against me will prosper, right? So I'm thinking I'm good. But there's a lot of people in the restaurant. I got to get them outside. So there's a slot underneath the counter. It had blank applications. And I pulled one out. I slapped it down. I said, you, I want you to go sit outside in the patio area. And I want you to fill this application out right now. <laughs> he, uh, here's a pen. He turned around and he went outside. And they've remodeled. But back in the day, there was an outdoor patio. It was just outdoor. It was half moon couple seats here and then it staircase down to the parking lot it, it, you know uh, totally exposed he obediently went out filled out that application in fact the detective told me everything he filled out on that application was correct <laughs> so I went and I told our assistant manager was working and he did he didn't know Jesus you know and so I said hey we're being robbed and the guy <laughs> the guy is sitting out waiting for the police and the police are on their way so you know how the bible tells us in second timothy 1 7 god has not given me the spirit of fear but one of power love and a sound mind right and so um i i just told you all this 
They're real. They're not just what? They're not just memory verses. No, no, please, please. If you just met Jesus, I'm telling you, it's amazing. The word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it's, it works. It's not, don't leave dust. Don't put dust on your Bible. Don't put dust on your Bible. You know what I mean. So the police, so he says, the, our assistant manager jumped up and he spun around three times. He spun around three times and he said, call the security. The secur what? security can't do anything. Anyways, he, uh, he walked out. He said he didn't hear me. He didn't hear me say that the robber's sitting across outside on the patio. So he w opened the doors and he sat down across from the robber. He took three weeks off after the robbery. And I, I tell you the truth. And so the so nobody believes me, right? And nobody believes me. And it's kind of fun. like, I'm like, is this happening? I mean, what? And so then the police car er, pulled up and they jump out, run past the robber. So he said, so they go, okay, what, what, what happened? Where are they? We've been trying to catch these guys. I said, he's right behind you. No, no, what happened? I said, he's sitting right there. So they turn around and grabbed him and they apologized later and they said, listen, in the history of mankind, no robber has ever been waiting for the police to come. <laughs> so it was like, we didn't hear what you were telling us. And so after that, they cleared out the whole restaurant and they sat me in this booth and uh, they, they said, uh, I still, Detective Harai sat across from me and the b young boy's name was Keat. It was drug money they were looking for and they just needed drugs. And so uh, he sat me down, there was 25 police officers, you can hear a pin drop in that restaurant. And he said, I want you to tell me word for word what you said to make this happen, <laughs> to get this, <laughs> You know, we've been after them. That's when he told us we've been after him for so long. And I said, you want me to tell you everything? He said, everything. And I said, well, I told him Jesus loved him and I preached the gospel. I told him everything that I shared. And by the way, I told Keith, I said, no matter what goes down today, what I'm telling That was weird. Anyways, <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Um, uh, what, what I'm telling, I told Keith, what I'm telling you is true. What I'm, everything I told you, Keith, is true. God loves you and has a plan for your life. And so anyways, I shared the gospel. He did not interrupt me. He let me say whatever I wanted to say till we, we were done. That detective leaned back and said, we all need to get born again. <laughs> and then, and then after, after that, um, the prosecuting attorney uh, said, hey, there's a preliminary hearing. Don't worry. Don't be nervous. It's just going to be the judge and uh, us and Keith's attorneys. Uh, they're just going to see if they even have, we even have a case to go to trial. And so um, you saw T.D. Jake sweat. Have you ever seen a Japanese American? <laughs> have you? Have you? I don't think so. This is a, this is a first. This is a first. So exciting to be here for the first time that you're seeing it. So um, this is not absorbent. I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> Listen, one time I, it, anyways, it's gonna waste my time. It's funny though. Do you wanna hear it? Should I tell, okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are so fun. It's ridiculous. You don't care about the word. You just want it. So anyways, um, I, I used to carry these raggedy old rags when I would preach. And I go, I got to, you know, I, I preached at a conference that Cece Winans was at. And she had this beautiful, like, eyelet, you know, beautiful little hanky, black hanky. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I got to step it up. So I was preaching the next day. So I went in my, <laughs> I got my travel scissors. I'm looking around, looking around. What? I, black, black. Black underwear, there they were. I cut, I cut a square out of those black underwear and I'm telling you, they were so absorbent. You know what? That's a great business idea, you're welcome. You better send me some for the mission field. Okay, Holy Spirit, now. 
okay, so uh, that's right. We're in the courtroom. And, oh, and we're walking down the hall of the courthouse and the prosecuting attorney said, hey, here's the story of Jesus and that little girl, you, you know. And so we got into the uh, courthouse and they opened the doors and it was packed with people, packed because God's funny. He's gonna milk everything he's got, right? And so they put me on the stand, Miss Tawny, that was my maiden name. You go ahead, tell us word for word what happened. And I was able to do it again. After that, they, they, he, uh, he got five years in jail. You know, I, I want to just go. I wish I was older. I would have I gone to see him in prison. It would have been a whole better story, long story. But anyways, um, uh, after that, pl the police department asked me to come and share. And uh, I'm not a preacher. That's not what I do. You know, uh, you, as you can tell, <laughs> it's chaos up here. <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Um, he said, hey, share whatever you want. I didn't know what I was talking about, but I just went there. Yeah, la, 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 Jesus, la, 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 Jesus, probably, you know. <laughs> but the world is hungry. They want to know who's your leader. As heaven begins to work in our everyday life, it's, that clock is as slow as molasses. It is amazing. <laughs> Oh my God, it's freaky. It's so freaky, I keep interrupting myself. Okay, as heaven begins to work in our everyday life, God reveals himself through us. Let me give you an example. L let me just repeat that. As heaven begins to work through our everyday life, God reveals himself through us. Hey, uh, you think, oh, I'm in the way, I'm in the way. Oh, no, let me tell you. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Like, when is that ever going to happen? Wow, that's amazing. We were doing, a, uh, there was a, traffickers that had been buying and selling children for 20 years where we were serving. And uh, we work with law enforcement, we work with governments wherever we are. We don't work outside of that. And um, there, we got enough intelligence to be able to do this raid on this traffickers compound and there we found a couple kids. But they were so far gone in all the years, we've never said no to a child coming to Zoe right away, but these were young boys violent, out of their minds because of all the substance abuse they kept them on to comply. Uh, they were strong but tiny. They needed a padded room. Let me tell you, they just needed a padded room for 24 hours. And so the Lieutenant Colonel who was the premier child rescue um, or premier child trafficking detective, he was so good until they promoted him to um, Interpol. But anyways, he, we worked together for years and years. He said, no, those boys have to go to Zoe now. They have to go to Zoe today. I said, no, 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 here's the deal. We need 24 hours. Just put them in a hospital. Just let them come down. We're, you know, we're missionaries, man. I mean, we're just missionaries. We're not, there's no doctors. There's no, you know, uh, we're missionaries. And he said, no, they have to go to Zoe. They have to go to Zoe. I said, we just killed six snakes on our property, two that don't have anti-venom. I said, we're going to pick up those little boys dead in the jungle because they're going to run. No, they have to go to Zoe. They have to go to Zoe. So after we're dialoguing back and forth, because for me, it was in the best interest of the child, right? I'm thinking. And this Buddhist police officer said to us, he said, will you just let them come to Zoe and let's see what your God will do? And I, he said, I've never seen a child go to Zoe where your God hasn't helped them. And he, sa and he said, in 48 hours, if I don't get testimony from these boys, if they're not healed up enough, in 40 hours to get testimonies, those traffickers go free after 20 years of buying and selling our children. You know, we don't make our kids testify ever but in the best interest of the child. It was then we looked up, we said, what? the minute they cross your threshold, they experience the presence of God. Yeah. You know, we're so used to it. I've been saved since I was five. I, I, his presence is familiar, but somebody who has never known him, who, who feels his presence, it's a game changer. Yeah. Even if they don't wanna change, they begin to melt. Yeah. And that's why, that's why there were, there's been so much um, results. 
Zoe, who cares about Zoe? Oh, here's the other thing. He did not say, oh, Zoe's so awesome. You guys are so amazing. The staff's amazing. The facilities are fantastic. Your program's amazing. He didn't say any of that. He said, let's see what your God will do. And it was like a dream. You don't see us. You don't see us. You only see him. Oh, my. It's like the lifetime dream that he would be known by our efforts, by our work, by our life, that he would be known. Oh, my gosh. Whatever God's mandate is on your life, here is a critical, a crucial tip. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, it says, Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you, and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do, in whatever you do, and he will lead you wherever you go. Don't think for a moment that you know it all, for wisdom comes from Uh, For wisdom comes when you adore him with undivided devotion and avoid everything that's wrong or avoid evil or avoid sin. Let me give you a natural picture of that. So I married the cutest boy in this whole room, the whole world. And he, he, for a vibrant love life, if I said, okay, babe, I'm going to block from six to seven every day, and I it's devoted to you alone. I'm gonna just whatever you want to say. I'm gonna listen, and we're gonna commune. It's gonna be awesome. But the rest of the day, shh, don't talk to me. But I'll see you tomorrow from six to seven. That's the weirdest love life ever, <laughs> right? It's no, it's weird. No, we have access to each other anytime we want. We want to talk to each other. We can't wait to see each other. Sometimes he'll be teaching Bible school, and I'll kick open the door, and I'll say, and all the students will get scared. And I'll go, I just wanted to tell you that I love you so much, and you're so gorgeous and so delicious and amazing. That's all. And this is why we can do that, because... We're the boss. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't do it often. I do it a little bit too much, but we don't do it often. <laughs> Listen, we have one life. We have one life. Earth life is very short. Heaven's long. You can't love them back in heaven. You're going to be perfect. Everything's going to be perfect. There's no opportunity to love him back. There's not going to be any hard times. There's no tears. There's no proving There's no showing that you love him. This is it now, earth life. That's it. And it's so short. Oh, my gosh. You know, the flower fades, the grass withers. You know that scripture? As a young person, I never believed it would happen. What? Flower fades? What? Wrinkles? You just don't even believe it. You don't even believe it's going to happen. And you you know how you play with your grandma's skin and it peaks and it stays there? (laughs) It is happening. It is happening. Listen, it's so fast you can't even believe it. It is so fast you can't even believe it. So you enjoy every day, every minute of every day. He made this earth for you. So it's just not all about, oh, we pray all day long. And When I was in my 20s, God said, write 100 things you want to do before you leave earth. I finished that list at 35. And I mean, we're talking about crazy things. He wants you to live. He wants to provide for you. He wants you to have fun. When we went skydiving, we said, Father, is it a good day? I mean, you're going to be involved in everything. He's involved with everything. We're not done with our race. So we have to ask him, is it a good day? Should we do it today? So even in the fun, you know, he participates. Have you ever noticed that in, in, when God calls, he, he never tells you 
about the giants in the land. He doesn't talk about that in your calling. When he calls you, he talks about vision. He said, Cass, this is what you're going to do. This is what I need from you. He never talks about the Red Sea, all the Red Seas on your journey. He doesn't talk about the enemies that the devil will use to harass you, hate you, want you dead, and have you stopped. He doesn't talk about any of that. Have you ever wondered why? I just, I, it just came to my mind. Yeah, why didn't, why didn't you like warn us or tell us or whatever? And this is exactly what he said. He goes, because they're a non-issue to me. They're nothing to him. Giants, uh, God our Father answers to no one. He has no rival in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That's who we serve. That's who keeps us in the palm of his hand. He owns impossible by the neck, and he makes impossible his footstool. He has every resource, human resources, financial resources, whatever we need that you will ever need to accomplish his dreams. And I'm, you know, the beautiful thing about getting old is you have hindsight. You have proof. I'll tell you a little story, a little proof story. Um, when Michael was praying, he came out of his prayer closet. This is early on when we were overseas. He said, God said it's time to build and buy. I said, awesome. Let's go to our building account and see what's in there. Oh, we don't have a building account. Oh, Actually, actually, we go month to month and we say to our U.S. office in our garage back in L.A., hey, how much money <laughs> do we have for this month that we're going to pay all the bills? Yeah, I don't know. She, every time, I don't know. And so, <clears throat> but I'm going to just skip ahead and say in 17 years, we've never missed a bill, never one time. And we've never stopped growing, never once. Millions and millions and millions of dollars needed to do what we've done, and we don't owe any, not a cent. We don't do it unless we have the money. We only want to owe God. And so, um, so Mike is looking for land. He finds the land, $265,000. But you might as well say $265 million because we don't have a penny. Uh, but that doesn't matter. You believe God. You're in training, right? You use every opportunity, training ground. Watch me, Father. Watch how I act. Watch what I say. Watch my heart. Look at my heart. It's better than last time. It's better than last time. Why? Because you're faithful. And I remind myself of your faithfulness. And you're, you're a good God. And, uh, you know, and so we're, we're journeying. And then somebody, it's a long story, so let me just tell you. Somebody sent 200000 for land specific land specific, and praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Somebody sent 10,000, that's awesome, 5,000 for land specific, supernatural, praying, and God said, so now we needed 50,000, but again, 50,000, what? We, we don't have it, so we can't buy the land. That's just how it is, you know, and we're new at missions. Do we go home? Because here's the thing. We started the organization in our garage with one lady we kept in the garage, and, <laughs> and she's, and so we, um, uh, and then we left. I, that, that's a whole nother story. It's an awesome story. But we cut our teeth on mm, man didn't supply for us ever. We never looked at man. We never had a sugar daddy in missions. Hey, hey believe me, that'd be okay if you do. That'd be awesome. But we never did, and we have always relied on God, and we've even said, test us. And we've been tested you want that million? This is what you're going to have to do. Nothing shady, nothing shady, but against the vision, against what God's instructions were. Not wrong, not wrong, just against what God told us to do. I'm sorry we can't take that money. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we walked away. The next morning, they say, I couldn't sleep all night. God appeared to me and said, you give them that money. It's from me. <laughs> Tell God, test me. Say it. Say, test me, Father. See if money has me. See if I'll bow to money. See if I'll manipulate mo for money. Test me. 
It's training. Why? Because he'll, then he can trust you with greater things. But you don't know. You don't know your heart condition. You don't know uh, uh, if you, how strong you are, what, what level of warrior you are if you're not tested. Okay, so then 50,000. So just real quick, a, a lady, it was 9 o'clock at night, and uh, the landowner called and said, um, yes or no, you're going to buy the land, it had been a year. And so Mike gathered us, and we, you know, none of us had any ideas, but we had this peace, peace of God. And, and believe me, we're not, our heads aren't up in the clouds like, woo. No, we plan, we count the cost, you know, all of those things. But we didn't have, do we go home? So we just said, you know what, call her and tell her we need to explain where we're at. Well, she misunderstood and said, and she, because we didn't speak the language, she didn't misunderstood. We were in another country. They don't speak English there. We did not communicate right. And so she went to them and said, hey, they're going to buy the land tomorrow. And so to make a long story short, and I'd love to make you squirm in your seat because it was that bad, um, we said, okay, okay, there's nothing. We, by the time we found out, there was nothing we could do to stop this freight train. And so I was at the children's home late, and Mike called me at 9 o'clock at night, and he said, listen to this email. It was by a single woman and said, you know, for months now, God has been speaking to me about sending Zoe $50,000 for land, but I thought there was too many zeros for sure, you know. I'd never, God had never asked me to borrow 50000 but I know it's God. It, we put it in your account. You can withdraw it tomorrow. So when we went the next day for that meeting, we had $265,000 to the penny. Not a penny over or under. Oh, there goes the clock. Okay, just one more story. Okay. Um, so if it's God's dreams, if it's God's dreams and his vision, he'll pay for it. If it's yours, if it's yours, if it's your dreams, you pay for it. Um Okay, so now we're in, um, building a 50-acre campus in Los Angeles, and it's a gazillion dollars compared to overseas. It's a gazillion. Um, unreasonable, it's ridiculous. And so, miracle, we get this 50 acres, miracle, na na. And now our design team says, hey, the first home, custom home for traffic girls, uh, trauma-informed home, it's uh, a, like a million dollars. So a million dollars is a familiar number, but it's still, you know, you're in training. <laughs> and Mike's better. He's, way, whoa, he's in a whole nother, like, company. And I'm still, like, with uh, some other people. And so I, so I don't say anything. I just say, okay, Father, and I just remember. I remember. I don't grumble like the Israelites. Man, have we learned our lesson from them? No, no. I remember the Red Seas. I remember the fire by night and the cloud by day. I remember his faithfulness. And so, um, just so you know, do you see that that 265000 had nothing to do with Mike and I? We didn't even have a marketing department. Th that money came supernaturally. We didn't woo it in. We didn't network. Not, we had nothing to do with that. Okay, now let me tell you. So we need to start to raise money for this million dollars. I don't know. Do we do a capital campaign? What do we, like, what do people do, right? And so um, it, it had just been a week since we found out how much this L.A. property was going to cost to build. And we get a call from a church that's vetting us, right? Do we want to get involved with Zoe? He says, I don't really know you guys, but there's a new couple in our church that said, hey, can you introduce us to a missionary or a nonprofit, whoever you trust? And the pastor says, I don't know what they want, but we have been around for 45 years and we have a lot of uh, people that we trust. But the Holy Spirit keeps saying, bring this couple to Zoe, bring them to Zoe. He said, are you available? We happened to be in the country. He said, yeah, bring them. We don't know them. We didn't make the call. They come, they sit down. We spend two hours just getting to know each other, talking. We don't know what they want. What do they want? The, their daughter's a missionary. We're thinking maybe they want encouragement, something. So at the third hour, we said, hey, is there anything we could do, help you? Do you want to know about Zoe? What is it? And they go, yeah, you could tell us about Zoe. But the wife of this couple didn't want to come to Zoe because she says, what do they do? She's oh, human trafficking. Ooh, that's too dark for me. I, I'm not. And the pastor says, no, I already booked the appointment. You got to go. She said, okay, no problem. So anyways, they 
so she said, yeah, you can share a little. But in our spirit, we're like, mm, we're just going to talk about Jesus, you know, uh, uh, and not about at all about Zoe because they didn't even seem interested. So we'll just encourage them in the Lord. So that was it. The businessman who's their little business owners said, hey, Mike, how much is the first home? Because we had a huge, we have a full master plan. plan and, and Mike says, oh, we just found out a week ago, a million dollars. The businessman goes, whoa, I know. So then they said, can we go to the property? 19 minutes from our office, we took them. And then that was it. They left, and literally that was it. That was Sunday afternoon. On Tuesday morning, we're awoken by this little email, and I mean a little email, that said, I just want to share the backstory of who we are, and then I'm going to add the backstory that I know. They, every month in their company for years, they give uh, to a nonprofit or a missionary. And at one point, God said, I need you to hold that money, and I have a place for it. Well, they were freaking out because it was adding up. So they said, there's starving children, there's, uh, you know, missionaries that need it. Oh my, homeless people, we miss God, for sure. They would tell each other, we miss God. And yet God would tell them, no, you, you hold that money. And so when they met us, we, when they left, we didn't say anything, we didn't cast a vision, nothing, what we're doing, nothing. They went home and they said, they didn't, talked to each other in the car. They got home, went in their prayer closets, came out, and they said, is this it? Yes, this is it. So where do I send you $1 million? <laughs> Just like that. Not even a phone number. Not even a phone number to call them to thank them. That's how much they didn't care. They didn't care about the money. They only obey God. So I said, hey, I emailed her back. I said, after picking ourselves up at the ground, and let me tell you, it wasn't for the money that we fell on the ground. For years, we had been preparing for this. Do you know how many people are following us? If, we, if this is our plan, it's our bill. We were freaking out saying, oh God, oh God, let this, did we hear you right? Did we hear you right? Did we hear you right? Because then he's got it. But if it's our will, oh, I'm so afraid of my will. And so, and so when the money came, it was like, yes, yes, thank you, Lord. Confirmation, you know, that it's his will. That's all we care about. Who cares about anything else? Who cares about anything else but just accomplishing what God wants? So the, this little couple, they're amazing. And we said, what's your business plan? Um, love God, love people. He's, they're super successful, super successful, but they don't have, a, they break every business strategy in the world. I mean, we even read business books, you know, on how to lead and strategize. No, not these people. No, just God, where, where do you want this money this month? Amazing. Why? Because they're postured, right? Their position right. Jesus, you're my Lord. And I listen to your voice and a voice of a stranger I run from, but I know my father's voice. So I'm going to close with telling you that in Mark 13, 10, but prior to the end of the age, the hope of the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whatever you're called to do, I pray that preaching the gospel is part of it. When he says to go, can I please use me as an example? If you don't have everything going for you, if you don't have all the answers, I'm telling you, if he says to go, don't worry. Just cling to him. Don't cling to your own understanding. I told you that scripture. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Just cling. Hang on. Hang on for dear life because it is amazing. You're going to love your life. You're going to love it. Okay, I am, now I'm three minutes over. I love you. I love you so much. You're so fun. You're so fun. Pastor Jimmy.